Welcome to Saving Castles, the podcast for castle and chateau enthusiasts. Join us as we explore the fascinating history, stories and culture of these awe-inspiring structures, from the legends and folklore to the latest in restoration. We'll cover it all, so whether you're a seasoned castle aficionado or just discovering the magic of these magnificent buildings, this is the podcast for you. So grab your headphones and let's dive in. In the hallowed halls of history, where valiant tales of chivalry intersect with whispers of clandestine spirituality, we find a saga that has stirred human imagination for nearly a millennium, the saga of the Knights Templar. Today, we commence a journey back in time, through the echoing chambers and winding corridors of the past, back to the Middle Ages, to the heart of the world's most enigmatic military order. Welcome to the first episode of a new series that ventures into the mysterious, often baffling realm of the Knights Templar and their medieval castle. Each episode in this series will carry you across the threshold of these formidable fortresses into the sacred spaces where the knights worshipped, the cavernous crypts where they stashed their legendary riches, and the grand banquet halls where they strategized and celebrated victories. We'll delve into the birth, rise and fall of the Templar Order, examine their unique dual role as warriors and monks, and discuss their enduring legacy that continues to inspire awe and intrigue. Our journey begins today, not with the clang of swords or the din of battle, but with the somber echoes of our ancestors' search for spiritual fulfillment and divine protection. We will set the stage with a peak into the origins of the Templars, tracing their emergence as an enigmatic blend of military might and spiritual devotion in the high Middle Ages. We will tread the ancient pathways of history, unearthing the layers of time, revealing the moments that have shaped our world, one castle at a time. But our quest is more than an exploration of ancient fortresses, more than an inspection of stone and mortar, It is an attempt to understand the human spirit in all its complexity, as reflected in the imposing castles that the Templars called home. So, buckle up as we commence this exhilarating journey, a journey guided by the flickering torchlight of history, glowing with tales of faith, courage, mystery and power. Today, we awaken the guardian echoes of medieval castles, the silent stories embedded in their weathered stones waiting to be told. Today, we step into the world of the Knights Templar. In the heart of the Holy Land, the air was dense with the echoes of war cries and prayers, scented with a heady blend of fear and hope. It was the year 1099, the dawn of the 12th century, and the final echoes of the First Crusade were dying down. Christian forces, stirred by religious fervor, had achieved a remarkable feat, the capture of Jerusalem. A sacred city, heavy with historical and religious significance, was now wrested from the grip of its Muslim rulers. However, the task of maintaining control over this holy land was far from easy. Across the vast expanses of Christendom, devout men and women heeded the call of their faith, embarking on perilous journeys to Jerusalem. Their hearts burned with religious zeal, and their eyes were lit with the hope of paying homage at the city's holy shrine. But the road to Jerusalem was fraught with danger. Desperate cries for protection from marauding bandits and rival factions punctuated the pilgrimage routes. It was in response to this plea that the Knights Templar were born. Their formation was the brainchild of two seasoned veterans of the First Crusade. Hugh de Paines, a French knight known for his courage and piety, and Godfrey de saint Omer, reputed for his strategic acumen. The duo proposed a revolutionary idea, a monastic order dedicated to the protection of Christian pilgrims journeying through the Holy Land. Recognizing the potential of this idea, Baldwin II, the then King of Jerusalem, welcomed their proposition. He granted them a headquarters in his palace, believed to be the site of the biblical temple of Solomon, and thus the order came to be known as the Poor Fellow, 
soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon, or the Templars, for short. In the initial years, the Templars were a humble assembly, just nine knights, bound by a solemn vow of poverty, obedience, and chastity. Their emblem was as austere as their lifestyle, a simple red cross on a white field, a symbol that would eventually inspire fear and admiration in equal measure across medieval Europe. Their fortunes took a turn in 1129, when they received the formal endorsement of the Catholic Church at the Council of Troyes. The event marked a pivotal moment in their story. Overnight, the Templars were transformed from a band of impoverished knights into a powerful religious order. The Church's endorsement was a clarion call for knights across Europe, inspiring them to rally under the Red Cross banner of the Templars. Their ranks swelled, as did their coffers. Nobles across Europe, seduced by the promise of spiritual rewards, were eager to support the Templars' mission. They donated land, cash, and even their sons to the order. In return, the Templars offered prayers for their benefactors' souls, ensuring their spiritual salvation. The Templars were shrewd custodians of this newfound wealth, leveraging it to build an extensive network of estates across Europe, outposts in the Holy Land, and, most importantly, a series of impregnable castles. This formidable property portfolio was managed from their iconic headquarters at the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, serving both as a base for military operations and as the spiritual heart of the order, by the mid-twelfth century, the Templars had ascended to a lofty pedestal, standing as a state within a state, immune to local laws and answering only to the Pope. They were the military elite of their time, feared on the battlefield and revered within the Church. Their white mantles adorned with a red cross were a ubiquitous presence during the Crusades, a beacon of hope for their allies and a harbinger of doom for their enemies. Thus, from humble beginnings, the Knights Templar rose to be an awe-inspiring force, their power resonating from the spiritual halls of the Vatican to the war-torn deserts of the Middle East. Their story is a testament to the compelling allure of a unique mission, a mission that married martial valor with deep religious devotion, a mission that played out within the imposing stone walls of the medieval castles they called home, the Knights Templar were more than just a group of devout monks. They were elite warriors imbued with a deadly blend of martial skill and fervent spirituality. They were stewards of a sacred mission, entrusted with the protection of Christian pilgrims and the defense of the Holy Land. To execute this dual mandate, they fortified their presence in the Levant, creating a network of castles that became their sanctuaries, their power centers, and their war rooms. These castles, scattered across the arid landscapes of the Middle East and the verdant expanses of Western Europe, were not mere military outposts. They were the beating heart of the Templar order, a tangible testament to their influence and strategic acumen. These fortified structures provided the Templars with both a protective shell and a base from which they could project their power. From the towering ramparts of these castles, the Templars maintained a vigilant watch over the surrounding areas. Their locations were chosen with strategic precision to control key trade routes, dominate crucial junctions, and command an unobstructed view of potential threats. These castles were their sentinels, Silent but watchful, their stone walls holding the line against the enemy forces. Inside these fortified walls, the Templars led a life dictated by their monastic vows and military duties. New recruits were trained in the art of war, imbuing them with the martial skills needed to protect the pilgrims and defend the realm. The injured and the weary found solace within the castle's healing confines. Their wounds tended, their spirits uplifted. However, these castles were more than just fortresses. They were living entities, pulsating with the rhythm of daily life. In the grand courtyards, squires would spar with seasoned knights, their swords glinting in the sunlight. In the kitchens, monks would labor over the day's meals, their quiet chanting blending with the crackling of fires and the clanging of pots. 
Each castle had its chapel, a serene oasis amidst the bustle of daily life. Here the Templars would gather at the break of dawn, their voices rising in unison as they sang hymns of devotion and prayed for divine guidance. It was in these hallowed spaces that the Templars sought spiritual nourishment, reinforcing their resolve and recommitting themselves to their sacred mission. Beyond their practical and spiritual functions, these castles were also symbolic. They were statements of power, their imposing silhouettes intended to command awe and demand respect. They were manifestations of the Templars' dual identity as monk warriors, incorporating elements of military architecture with spaces for religious worship. But these castles were not just expressions of power. They were the embodiment of the Templars' commitment to their cause, physical affirmations of their vow to protect Christendom. From the seclusion of their castles, the Templars planned their military campaigns, poring over maps by the flickering candlelight, strategizing under the watchful eyes of their forefathers etched in the stone walls. When their plans were set and the dawn of battle arrived, the Templars would ride out from their castles, their white mantles flapping in the wind, their red crosses ablaze against the morning sky. After the battle, whether in victory or defeat, they would return to their stone sanctuaries, their castles standing as steadfast as their resolve, ready to heal, regroup, and fight another day. Each Templar castle has its tale to tell, its secrets etched into the ancient stones. They witnessed the rise and fall of the Templar order, their stone walls echoing with tales of courage, faith, and ultimately of dissolution. Through the following episodes of this podcast series, we'll continue to journey into these castles, exploring their history, understanding their significance, and appreciating their role in shaping the world as we know it. As the sun dips below the horizon, plunging the landscape into twilight, a hush descends upon the castle. It is time for Compline, the final prayer of the day, and the Templar knights gather in the castle chapel, their faces illuminated by the soft glow of flickering candles. The air is thick with anticipation and reverence, the silence broken only by the shuffle of feet and the rustle of cloaks. It is in this sacred quietude that we begin our journey into the hidden life of the Templars within their castle walls. Our exploration of the Templar castles must begin with an understanding of their inhabitants, the Templar knights themselves. The knights were sworn to a life of austerity, their vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience mirroring the monastic orders of their time. But unlike the monks, these knights were also warriors, their days punctuated by rigorous military training and their nights spent in contemplative prayer. The daily life of a Templar was a study in discipline and routine. Each day began before dawn with the ringing of the chapel bell, calling the knights to matins. The first prayer of the day, clad in their iconic white mantles, the knights would congregate in the chapel, their voices rising in unison as they recited the psalms. After matins, the knights would break their fast, sharing a meal in the castle's communal dining hall. Meals were simple affairs in keeping with their vow of poverty, and were consumed in silence as a brother read passages from the Holy Scriptures. The rest of the day was dedicated to their military duties and administrative responsibilities. The castles played a vital role in shaping the Templars' military prowess. These fortified structures provided the training grounds for the knights, their ramparts doubling up as obstacle courses, their courtyards serving as arenas for combat drills. It was here, within these stone walls, that squires learned the art of war, honing their skills under the watchful eyes of seasoned knights. But the Templar castles were not just military academies. They were also centers of administration and finance. The Templars had developed an efficient management system to govern their vast estates, and it was within the castle walls that these logistical operations were coordinated. The castles housed the Order's treasury, its records, and its official seal, making them the nerve centers of Templar administration. Integral to the Templars' daily life were their rituals and traditions. These ceremonies, often shrouded in mystery, were fundamental to their identity and their mission. 
Initiation into the Templar Order was a solemn affair, with the aspiring knight swearing his vows before the assembled brothers in the castle chapel. The Templars also observed a strict code of conduct, their behaviour governed by a set of rules known as the Latin Rule. This code dictated everything from their dress code to their meal times, ensuring that the knights maintained a lifestyle that was in line with their vows. The castles played host to these rituals, their walls, bearing silent witness to the Order's traditions. It was within these castles that the Templars lived out their dual role as monks and warriors, their lives oscillating between the battlefield and the chapel. Their lifestyle was austere, their discipline unyielding, and yet there was an allure to the Templars' life within the castle walls. It was a life imbued with a sense of purpose, a life lived in the service of a higher calling. It was this dedication to their cause, this unwavering commitment to their mission, that resonated through the stone corridors of the Templar castles, echoing into the annals of history. In the heart of the medieval landscape, the Templar castles stood like stone sentinels, their imposing silhouettes etched against the horizon. They were fortresses of faith, their formidable defences a testament to the strategic genius of their architects. Understanding the Templars' castle defence strategies takes us deeper into the heart of their order, revealing the Templars' not only as pious monks and valiant warriors, but also as master strategists and astute tacticians. The very location of Templar castles bore the imprint of their strategic brilliance. Each castle was deliberately positioned to exert control over its surrounding area. They were often built on elevated terrain, providing a vantage point that allowed the Templars to spot approaching enemy forces from a distance. The choice of location was not solely influenced by the landscape's defensive potential. It also considered the castle's role as a control point for important trade routes, water sources and agricultural lands. The architecture of the Templar castles was designed with defence as its primary objective. Their castles were often encased within a series of concentric walls, each serving as an additional layer of defence. These walls were punctuated by fortified towers, providing an elevated platform for archers and serving as lookout points. The castle's entrance was typically narrow and easily defensible, designed to funnel invading forces into a vulnerable position. Each castle was built around a central keep, the last line of defence in case of a breach. This keep, often the tallest and most heavily fortified part of the castle, housed the Templar's command centre and the castle's most vital functions, such as the treasury and the armoury. The Templar's defensive strategies extended beyond the physical architecture of their castles. They also had a detailed understanding of siege warfare and had developed an array of tactical responses to various forms of attack. They incorporated innovative technologies, like the use of Greek fire, a flammable substance that could stick to surfaces and continue burning even on water. Another key defensive strategy of the Templars involved the use of intelligence and reconnaissance. Templar knights, often serving as scouts, would conduct regular patrols around their territories. These patrols were essential in providing early warning of enemy movements and gathering vital information about potential threats. Despite their emphasis on defence, the Templars were not a passive force. They believed in the principle of active defence, frequently launching counter-attacks and sorties against besieging forces. This proactive strategy, combined with their formidable defences, made their castles difficult to conquer, often deterring potential attackers. The Templars' strategic acumen was also reflected in their logistical organisation. Templar castles were often self-sufficient, equipped with their sources of food and water, capable of withstanding long sieges. These castles were interconnected, forming a network that allowed for rapid response and mutual support in times of crisis. A signal from one castle could rally the knights from neighbouring castles, reinforcing the defensive capabilities of the entire network. Ultimately, the Templars' defensive strategies were not simply a product of military necessity. They were a reflection of their core values. J. 
Just as they defended Christian pilgrims on their perilous journeys, so too did they defend their castles with a mix of courage, tactical brilliance, and unyielding faith. As we step away from the towering ramparts and the shadowed archways of the Templar castles, we carry with us a newfound appreciation for the Templar's strategic prowess. In the dim, flickering light of torches, nestled within the heart of Templar castles, were their vault spaces shrouded in whispers of unimaginable wealth and power. Legends have embellished the richness of the Templar treasury over the centuries, yet beneath these tales of unfathomable wealth we find a story of shrewd management, religious devotion, and immense responsibility. The Templars' wealth was a product of their dual identity as monk warriors. They received donations in the form of money, land, and valuable artifacts from nobles, kings, and even common people. The donations were not just acts of charity, but also a form of spiritual insurance. Many believed that by donating to the Templars, they were securing a place for themselves in heaven. The Templar castles, as the Order's headquarters, served as the primary depositories for this wealth. However, it is essential to understand that the Templars did not view wealth as an end unto itself. Instead, they saw it as a means to fulfill their divine mission. They utilized their resources to maintain their network of castles, finance military campaigns, and support the welfare of Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land. The Templar treasury, therefore, was not just a symbol of their affluence, but also an embodiment of their sacred duty. The Templars proved themselves to be adept at managing this vast wealth. Within the confines of their castle walls, they developed some of the earliest forms of banking practices. Pilgrims and nobles could deposit their money at one Templar castle and withdraw it at another in exchange for a written note. This innovative system offered security and convenience to travellers, and it played a significant role in expanding the Templars' wealth. However, the administration of such vast resources was not without challenges. Each castle had its treasury, managed by appointed Templar brothers, who were responsible for keeping detailed records of all transactions. This administrative duty required the Templars to maintain high standards of accuracy and accountability, reinforcing their commitment to the virtues of honesty and integrity. Their wealth and their efficient management practices inevitably led to the Templars extending their financial services to secular affairs. They started lending money and offering financial advice to nobles and kings, gradually becoming indispensable to the economic workings of medieval Europe. This financial involvement earned them both allies and enemies and played a critical role in their eventual downfall. The Templar treasury also held a significant amount of religious artifacts. These items, often gifted to the Templars, were considered to be of immense spiritual value. They served not only as tokens of devotion, but also as symbolic representations of the Templars' spiritual mission. Amidst the gleaming gold and sparkling gems of the Templar treasury, we find a narrative of strategic brilliance, spiritual duty, and economic influence. It is a tale that speaks to the Templar's role as defenders of the faith, as stewards of the divine mission, and as pioneers in the financial landscape of the medieval world. The echoes of the Templar treasury, however, are not just confined to the past. They may reverberate through time, shaping our understanding of the Templar order and influencing the evolution of our modern banking systems. As we delve deeper into the fascinating world of Templar castles, we find ourselves standing before a grand testament to medieval architectural prowess. The castles stand as enduring symbols of the mason skills, their walls whispering tales of engineering genius and artistic vision. Every stone, every archway, every tower of these fortresses bears the imprint of the Templars' influence, reflecting their unique blend of martial prowess and monastic devotion. The architectural style of Templar castles combine the practical requirements of a fortress with elements of ecclesiastical architecture. 
This resulted in a unique style that reflected the dual identity of the Templars as both warriors and monks. The Templars were known for their adeptness at fortifying their castles, and this is most evident in their use of the concentric design. This style of castle featured multiple layers of defences, typically in the form of high, thick walls, each encircling the other, and each providing an additional line of defence against attackers. This design not only provided formidable protection, but also allowed the Templars to strategically place their troops during a siege. The Templar castles were not merely military structures, they were also places of worship. The castle chapel was a crucial part of the structure, and its design often reflected the architectural trends of the era. In many Templar castles you can find elements of Romanesque and early Gothic architecture, with their rounded arches and intricate stone carvings. These chapels were often located near the heart of the castle, signifying the central role of spiritual practices in Templar life. The masonry skills exhibited in these castles are nothing short of remarkable. The Templars often employed the best stonemasons of their time, and their expertise is evident in the craftsmanship seen in the stone walls, towers, and inner buildings of the castles. The masons used a combination of local and imported stone, carefully choosing materials based on their strength, durability, and aesthetic appeal. The Templar castles also reflect the influence of different cultures. As the Templars travelled through Europe and the Middle East during the Crusades, they came into contact with diverse architectural styles. They incorporated these influences into their designs, leading to a fascinating fusion of Western and Eastern architectural elements in their castles. The architectural prowess of the Templars extended beyond their castles. They were also responsible for building a network of roads, bridges, and watchtowers. This infrastructure facilitated travel and communication between their castles, enhancing their ability to defend their territories and aid pilgrims on their journey to the Holy Land. As we admire the architectural marvels of the Templar castles, we find in them a reflection of the Templar order itself a combination of strength and spirituality, pragmatism and piety, austerity and elegance. These stone structures, standing against the test of time, serve as a testament to the Templars' unique identity and their enduring legacy. Let's take a moment to appreciate the grandeur of these architectural masterpieces, their towers reaching towards the heavens, their stone walls echoing with the history of a bygone era. We carry with us the memory of their architectural splendor, a symbol of the Templars' artistic vision and engineering genius. The world of the Templars was one steeped in deep spirituality. Beyond the martial prowess and strategic brilliance, the Templars were, first and foremost, monks devoted to the service of God. The castles of the Templars, echoing with centuries of fervent prayers, stood as bastions of this unwavering faith, serving as spiritual strongholds in a tumultuous world. The Templars' spiritual practices were shaped by their unique role as warrior monks. Their rule, a code of conduct that every Templar was expected to follow, outlined a rigorous schedule of prayers, fasting, and religious services, this rule served as the spiritual backbone of the order, guiding their actions and anchoring them in their faith. An integral part of the Templars' spiritual practices involved the celebration of the Holy Mass. This was a central ritual in their daily routine, a moment of communion with God that strengthened their resolve and reaffirmed their commitment to their holy mission. The Eucharist, the spiritual sustenance received during the Mass was considered vital for their spiritual and physical well-being. The Templars' devotion also found expression in their veneration of the Holy Cross. The cross was not just an emblem adorning their red mantles. It was a symbol of their faith, a reminder of Christ's sacrifice, and a beacon guiding their spiritual journey. Templar castles often housed relics related to the cross, and these were treated with profound reverence. The Templars also practiced a form of contemplative prayer known as the Templar Meditation. This 
meditative practice was rooted in the Christian monastic tradition and involved quiet reflection, visualization, and deep introspection. It allowed the Templars to seek spiritual guidance, cultivate inner peace, and maintain a strong spiritual connection amidst the challenges of their martial duties. The role of Templar castles as spiritual strongholds extended beyond their walls. The influence of these castles permeated the surrounding lands, transforming them into landscapes of faith. The castles often served as pilgrimage sites for Christians, seeking spiritual solace, their chapels becoming places of prayer and reflection for the larger community. Understanding the Templars' spiritual practices and their castle's role as centers of faith helps us see beyond their martial exterior to the deeply spiritual core that guided their every action. The Templar castles, in their silent grandeur, bear witness to this profound spirituality, their stones resonating with echoes of fervent prayers and solemn liturgies. As we prepare to delve deeper into the complex relationship between the Templars and the Papacy, let us take a moment to appreciate the Templars' unwavering devotion, reflected in the spiritual legacy of their castles. The Templar castles, in their timeless serenity, stand as a testament to the enduring faith of the Templars, their spiritual legacy resonating through the ages. The intertwined destinies of the Knights Templar and the papacy form one of the most intriguing chapters in the annals of medieval history. The Templars, an order of warrior monks and the papacy, the seat of spiritual authority in Christendom, shared a relationship that was as convoluted as it was consequential. Like the stone walls of the Templar castles, their relationship was marked by strength and steadfastness, yet also punctuated by cracks and fractures. From the founding of the Templar Order in the early 12th century, the papacy played a significant role. Pope Honorius II granted the Templars official recognition in 1128 at the Council of Troyes, legitimizing their existence and defining their mission. This papal endorsement bestowed upon the Templars a mantle of spiritual authority that significantly bolstered their standing in medieval society. The papacy not only recognized the Templars, but also endowed them with a wealth of privileges and exemptions. Templar castles, as the physical manifestations of the order, fell directly under the jurisdiction of the papacy. This meant that the Templars were exempt from local laws and taxes, and were answerable only to the Pope. These privileges reinforced the Templars' independence, and significantly enhanced their power and influence. In return for these privileges, the Templars pledged their unwavering loyalty to the papacy. They vowed to defend the faith and to protect Christian pilgrims traveling to the Holy Land. The castles of the Templars, scattered across Europe and the Middle East, served as the concrete embodiment of this commitment. However, this relationship between the Templars and the papacy was not devoid of tension. The Templars' vast wealth, military power, and autonomy often led to conflicts with local clergy and secular authorities. At the same time, the papacy, wary of the Templars' growing influence, sought to maintain control over the order. This delicate balance of power began to unravel in the early 14th century. Under the reign of Pope Clement V and the influence of the French King Philip IV, the Templars found themselves on trial for heresy and other crimes. The castles that once stood as symbols of their power were seized, and many Templars, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay, were arrested and later executed. The suppression of the Templars in 1312 at the behest of the papacy marked a drastic shift in their relationship. The order that was once the champion of Christendom, endorsed and protected by the papacy, was now condemned and disbanded. Despite their downfall, the Templars left behind a legacy intertwined with that of the papacy. The Templar castles, in their enduring grandeur, bear testament to the order's influence and the pivotal role of the papacy in shaping their destiny. These stone fortresses, standing as silent witnesses to the passing of ages, echo the complex relationship between the Templars and the papacy, a relationship marked by faith, power, and the inexorable march of history.
Reflecting on the Templar papal nexus, we gain valuable insights into the dynamics of power, faith, and politics in medieval Christendom. The Templar castles, with their towering walls and sacred sanctuaries, serve as enduring symbols of this historical interplay. As we journey through the annals of the Templars, these castles remind us of their monumental saga, a saga intertwined with the spiritual and temporal powers of their time. The Knights Templar, once the most powerful order in Christendom, met a dramatic end in the early 14th century, a confluence of political machinations, financial envy and societal shifts resulted in their suppression. The castles that once proudly displayed their cross emblazoned banners, now stood witness to the Order's downfall. The fate of the Templars began to darken under the reign of King Philip IV of France. Deeply indebted to the Order, Philip sought to eliminate his debt and seize their vast wealth. He launched a campaign of accusations, charging the Templars with heresy, blasphemy, and numerous other crimes. On Friday the 13th of October, 1307, a date that would become infamous, Philip ordered the arrest of all Templars in France, including the Grand Master Jacques de Molay. The captured Templars were subjected to brutal torture, resulting in coerced confessions that further tarnished the Order's reputation. Meanwhile, Pope Clement V, under the pressure from King Philip, issued the papal bull Pastoralis Preeminentiares in November 1307 instructing all Christian monarchs in Europe to arrest Templars and seize their assets. Templar castles, once invincible fortresses, were now confiscated and turned over to other orders or to the crown. The trial of the Templars was a protracted affair, stretching over several years. Despite efforts by Templars to defend their order, the papacy, in a dramatic turn of events, formally disbanded the Knights Templar in 1312, under the papal bull vox in excelso. The final blow came in 1314, when Jacques de Molay, the last Grand Master, was burned at the stake in Paris, effectively marking the end of the Templar order. The suppression of the Templars led to a wide dispersal of their assets. Their extensive network of castles and estates was partitioned and transferred to rival orders such as the Knights Hospitaller or reverted to the control of the Crown. In Spain and Portugal, where the Templars enjoyed substantial royal favour, their properties, including their castles, were absorbed into new orders, such as the Order of Christ in Portugal. The Templar castles, once bustling with life and activity, now stood silent. Some continued to serve as fortresses or estates under new ownership, while others fell into disrepair. These stone structures, once the symbols of Templar power and spirituality, were now poignant reminders of their dramatic downfall. Despite the suppression, the Templars and their castles left an indelible mark on history. The stories of their bravery, spirituality, and eventual downfall continue to echo through the silent halls of their castle. These castles, in their enduring grandeur, are historical palimpsests bearing the traces of the Templars' dramatic saga. As we reflect on the fate of the Templars, we recognize a profound paradox. An order that wielded immense power, guarded by formidable castles, was brought down, not by an external enemy, but by the very society they vowed to protect. The Templars' fall from grace serves as a powerful reminder of the unpredictability of history and the impermanence of power. With the castles standing as silent sentinels to the Templars' history, we are transported back to a time of knights and kings, of faith and power, of glory and downfall. Each stone, each tower, each echo in these castles narrates a part of the Templars' tale, a tale that continues to fascinate, instruct and inspire. Long after their dissolution, the Knights Templar continue to exert an extraordinary influence on our collective imagination, culture, and architecture. The castles they constructed, impressive for their time and inspiring even today, serve as physical touchstones to their legacy. 
These enduring edifices not only reflect the Templars' architectural ingenuity and craftsmanship, but also reveal the depth of their influence on our modern world. The Templar castles were renowned for their strategic design and formidable defences. With imposing walls, elevated towers, and cleverly designed gatehouses, these castles were veritable fortresses that challenged even the most determined adversaries. This defensive architectural style has significantly influenced subsequent military architecture worldwide. Many later fortresses and citadels borrowed design elements from Templar castles, acknowledging their effectiveness in safeguarding the inhabitants. Beyond their military prowess, the Templars' architectural genius is reflected in the functional and aesthetic aspects of their castles. The Templars were one of the first to incorporate rounded designs, such as circular towers and apses in their castles. These rounded designs were not only visually appealing, but also provided strategic advantages, such as better visibility and resistance against siege weaponry. The influence of these design elements is evident in many subsequent architectural movements, including the Romanesque and Gothic styles. The influence of Templar castles extends beyond architecture. They have also permeated popular culture, often serving as inspiration in literature, film and video games, from Sir Walter Scott's Ivanhoe to the blockbuster movie Indian Jones and The Last Crusade and the popular video game series Assassin's Creed, Templar castles and the legends that surround them continue to captivate audiences, testifying to their enduring allure. Moreover, Templar castles have become important symbols in the study and appreciation of medieval history. They serve as physical narratives telling stories of faith, valor, power, and downfall. Historians, archaeologists, and tourists alike flock to these sites, seeking a glimpse into the intriguing world of the Knights Templar. Furthermore, the Templars' ideals of courage, piety, and service, as symbolized by their castles, have left a lasting impact on various societies and institutions. Various modern organizations, such as the Masonic Knights Templar, draw inspiration from the Templars, emulating their symbols and rituals. However, perhaps the most significant influence of Templar castles lies in their testament to human resilience and creativity. Despite numerous challenges, including wars, political pressures, and changing societal structures, these castles continue to stand. They remind us of the enduring human spirit that strives to create, protect, and persevere. Templar castles, in their timeless majesty, continue to echo the spirit of the Templars. They stand as enduring symbols of the Templars' indomitable courage, unwavering faith, and exceptional architectural genius. As we walk through their halls, climb their towers, and marvel at their formidable walls, we are not merely observers of history. We are participants in a living legacy. Through these castles, we continue to engage with the Templar's story, reminding us of their extraordinary influence that still resonates in our modern world. The Knights Templar, though silenced centuries ago, continue to speak to us through the magnificent castles they left behind. These architectural gems are significant historical repositories reflecting the valor, spirituality, and ingenuity of the Templars. However, preserving these testaments to our past is no small feat. As we consider the necessity and efforts to conserve these sites, we appreciate their irreplaceable value and the responsibility we bear towards safeguarding this heritage. The importance of Templar castles transcends their aesthetic appeal or architectural brilliance. They serve as windows to the past, offering us a glimpse into the lives and endeavors of the Templars. Each room, corridor, and tower embodies a facet of the Templars' existence. Their martial skills, spiritual devotion, community organization, and architectural innovation. When we preserve these castles, we ensure the survival of these stories, maintaining a tangible link to our shared past. Preserving Templar castles also benefits our understanding of the broader historical context.
Given the Templars' pan-European presence and their crucial role during pivotal historical events, such as the Crusades, their castles provide invaluable insights into medieval, social, political, and religious dynamics. These fortresses tell tales not only of knights and warfare, but also of medieval society, religion, and power structures. The preservation of Templar castles also bears economic and cultural significance. They are important tourist destinations, contributing to local and national economies. They serve as venues for historical reenactments, cultural festivals, and educational tours, playing a vital role in promoting cultural tourism and community engagement. Yet, preserving these centuries-old structures is a challenge. Exposure to the elements' neglect and, in some cases, vandalism, have taken a toll on many Templar castles. Restoring and maintaining these sites require substantial financial resources, technical expertise, and long commitment. Numerous organizations and individuals have stepped forward to protect this precious heritage. Governments, heritage bodies, and private entities have initiated and funded restoration projects to save these historical gems. Some castles, like the Castle of Tomar in Portugal, have been meticulously restored and are recognized as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Additionally, local communities often play a vital role in preserving Templar castles. In many regions, community-led initiatives are responsible for maintaining and promoting these sites. Local volunteers organize guided tours, cultural events and educational programs, sharing the Templar legacy with visitors and ensuring that the local community remains invested in its preservation. On the global stage, organizations such as UNESCO and the World Monuments Fund have recognized the importance of preserving Templar castles, including them in their mission to protect the world's cultural heritage. Their work involves restoration projects, awareness campaigns, and advocacy work, all directed towards ensuring the survival of these structures for future generations. However, there is still much work to be done. Many Templar castles remain in precarious conditions, and their stories risk being lost forever. It is our collective responsibility to ensure that these voices from the past continue to resonate. We must strive to protect, preserve, and pass on this legacy, treating these castles not merely as relics of a bygone era, but as living narratives that inform our present and inspire our future. The legacy of the Knights Templar is etched in the stones of their castles. As we endeavor to preserve these historical masterpieces, we honor the memory of the Templars and enrich our understanding of our shared history. These castles, standing resolute against the march of time, remind us that while civilizations may rise and fall, their echoes never truly fade away. By preserving Templar castles, we ensure that the echoes of the Templars continue to resound, telling their story to all that will listen. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Saving Castles podcast. Stay tuned for our next episode where we'll continue to explore the fascinating world of castles and chateaus. Don't miss out and subscribe to our podcast to get notified when new episodes are released. For more information about us and our work, visit savingcastles.com. Thank you for listening.